Hey everyone, if you're a fan of the show, please head over to MikeyOp.com and click the subscribe button. It's the best way to support us, and it's free. That's M-I-K-E-Y-O-P-P dot com. Thanks! Hi, I'm Mike Oppenheim, and you're listening to Coffin Talk, Exit Interviews with the Living, a weekly podcast that explores how our views on death affect the way we live our life. With me today from Seattle, Washington, is Matine Justice. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And you are my first official interview with someone I absolutely do not know. And this is the first time we're talking, so I'm excited. Yeah, me too. Um, we have a mutual friend who was already featured on the podcast. His is debuting actually in two weeks, but by the time people hear this, he will already have been out. So that was Alex Rice from a previous interview. So maybe we'll just start with that. Um, how do you know Alex and uh, you guys both live in Seattle, I'm assuming? Yeah, we both live in Seattle. I met Alex through my husband's job because um, my husband and Alex used to work together at a um, tech company. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Cool. And then he referred you to me because he said you have a lot of experience with death. So I guess I'll just kind of hop into that. Uh, what exactly was he referring to? Oh, um, I have been a home care hospice worker for the past 14 years, and I uh, help people live well and die well as best as they can. Awesome. Awesome. Um, wow. Yeah. So I did volunteer hospice for three years, um, but it was it was not in home. It was at a facility with dementia. Um, and so I saw like a lot of things that they actually didn't change my mind, but they helped reinforce things. So I'm kind of curious what, uh, what's your journey been like? Um, I feel like since I've observed and helped people like physically die, when I think about what happens to me after I would die is, um, I don't really think about, uh, like a higher being directing me where to go, whatever, but I feel like my existence kind of stays alive in the memories that I, other people have of me. So in that case, that's how I live on is in the memory of other people and in that, in that nature. Wow. That's a really cool. And have you spent a lot of time thinking about this because of the job or have you spent, is it just something that naturally came up? Um, I think this came on early on because um, my family is from Cambodia and my parents escaped genocide and a civil war. So I definitely have a secondary PTSD from growing up with that, uh, with my parents' experience and their experience with death and dying. And My mom, five of her siblings died in the war and my dad, he was a um, grave digger. He had to bury a bunch of his friends. So um, death is very near to me for a very long time. <laughs> Wow, that's extremely intense. I, I want to offer like full condolences to everyone involved with that, including you. I, I wow, yeah. I mean, I um, my son lives in Thailand, so um, and he lives with his mother, and so I, I'm very familiar with Thailand, and then of course Cambodia as like this dark kind of taboo subject in their culture. So um, yeah, yeah, they've they've had a uh, they've had a history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So wow, um, that's incredible. Um. I think for now, though, I'll keep the questions more focused on your particular experience. Um, so with, with do you, first of all, what is your, what are your degrees or what sort of like official uh, training did you have to get this career? Um, well, I went to school for um, developmental psychology. And uh, when I went to college, as a weekend job, I did 24-hour, 12-hour care, um, helping people with dementia, and uh, I'm Alzheimer's and dementia trained, uh, hospice trained. I'm a nurse assistant. Um, so the clinical, like medical aspects of, you know, making sure people have their meds and all that, I am familiar with that. And um, but my experience with people dying, I find that people love to share stories about themselves. And that's the thing I really, really appreciate with my line of work is I get to hear what people have to say about themselves and due to their mental condition or what have you, it may not be true or factual, but it's still real to them. And so I'm just sitting there witnessing them and their story. And I feel like that is such a good part of, I guess, summing up or, you know, summing up their life to, to share and pass on to other people. 
Wow. I am okay. I already have 20 questions like loaded in my head now. So I'm going to try to uh, do them in, I guess the most chronological order that would make sense to an audience listening. So um, let's just go way back in time. What's um, or not way back. I'm sorry. What, what is uh, one of your more memorable experiences with someone passing meaning like a story or an attitude that really struck you and it could be negative or positive, whatever. Um, I was helping um, someone who was late stage breast cancer and she lived alone and she just needed someone to be there present. And so I came in and she just asked me for um, granola with almond milk. And it took me 15 minutes to find it in her fridge because it's my first time there. And I just sat with her and she told me about her life and her friends and her travels. And what really struck me was she just wanted to share. There was no um, concerns about like her business or, you know, do you need to call so-and-so? It was just she wanted to share her life story. And with that, I'm always reminded of like those experiences always remind me to um, live my life purposefully and completely as much as I know how to live. And the, sport, the stories that are shared to me in some ways can shift how I can do better for myself and do better for other people. So I was raised Buddhist and a big reality for me is life is suffering and a way to ease the suffering of others and yourself is to listen and validate and be present with someone. And so in that moment, with this lady who was actively dying. I was just present with her. I gave her granola and milk, even though she knew she wasn't going to eat the whole thing. And um, I've given many people last meals, and I've actually collected thoughts about that over the years of what people ask for at the end of their lives. Um, Anything you want to share? Uh, Anything like? uh, (laughs) I've been asked uh, to prepare a head of cauliflower, um, beef stroganoff, chicken paprikash, uh, tubs and tubs of egg salad. And, you know, they, they, I, I understand that they're not going to eat it all. They may not be able to even swallow, but just to ask for that comfort, something they know, I feel that's kind of a, an emotional sustenance, you know, that I can give them. And uh, that means a lot to me that I can do that for them. That's really cool. And actually that kind of segues to the question I was going to ask before this, which is, um, what, how would you explain the difference between physical suffering and emotional suffering, or do you see one at all? I definitely see um, physical suffering, suffering as acute, but your perception of that pain is dependent on how you are emotionally uh, reacting to it. And I find that um, with me growing up, um, literally having to take care of myself because my parents weren't able to be emotionally present. People told me, I was like, Oh, you're, you know, so grown up or all of sounds like, well, I had to take care of myself. So at times people would say that I was aloof or, you know, a bit distant. And that was just me trying to take care of myself because that's all I knew. And so being facing that pain of going on it, I'm on my own really helped me, feel what I needed to feel. And that's definitely separate from like falling off a bike and, you know, scraping your knee or something because that kind of goes away, but emotional pain lingers and and stays with you. Um, And sometimes those things you can't let go. You just find different ways to carry it throughout your whole life. And um, I find that grief, especially at the end of life, um, folks have a hard time handling that because they may have thought that this grief would have gone away or, you know, and so it can be very scary at the end. You know, I've had some people, you know, shout and yell at me when they're dying and other people are just like, Oh, here I go, you know, and they're off, they're gone. Um, but yeah. Well, cool. That kind of helps me sculpt a question differently than I was going to ask it. Um, I know that I'm asking a question that's loaded with judgment and you don't sound like someone who judges. So that's on me, not on you, but do you think some people are better than others at dying? Hmm. Yeah, better is a loaded term. I would say um, some people are more informed with accepting their mortality. 
I've had folks yelling at me and screaming that where's their God? Why are they suffering this way? Or they would come to a point where they're so delirious, they turn to me and they say, are you God? Are you here to take me? And I can just say to them, no, I'm not God, but I'm your friend and I'm here, you know. And for some folks that calms them and other folks, it just, they just can't be consoled and they kind of go in pain. Um, I find that a big thing is uh, when uh, some people die, they call out for their mother or, you know, someone or something that's comforting. And I find that um, if I hold their hand or if I hum a song they're familiar with, it's that familiarity that anchors them to be calm and okay and they feel that they're safe. And so that's a better way to die. Um, but it's hard to say, you know, when I come and visit people, I, I just am there and present in whatever part of their journey they're at. So it's hard to say, uh, if someone's going to go better, uh, go, they're going to die better or worse, you know, with the experience that I have with them. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm learning a lot because like I said, I had three years experience with hospice as a volunteer, but like. It's very different. There's always doctors and nurses and other people around who are more qualified than me. So I haven't had like the unique perspective that you're, you're explaining to me. And I've seen like shades of what you're talking about, but, um, so I'm kind of curious and this will make sense. I think as you answer it, but, um, prior to, or during your career in this field, have you ever thought you were going to die? Um, I was in a car accident. Um, what year was that? 2017. I was going straight on a uh, road that had a T-stop. And there was a guy who cut in front of me who was trying to make a left in front of me. He thought he could make it, and he didn't. So he hit me right at my front driver's side headlight. And then the uh, airbag went it off in my face, and my head hit the back of the the chair and... I just sat there. I was like, this is it. It was not it. I was able to pull over. <laughs> yeah. But you did have that, that brief thought. Yeah. And so do you think in reflecting, do you think you were ready? Were you prepared mentally if that was it, all of it? I think so. I think so. I, um, I tell people and share with people that I care about that they know that I love them. They, you know, I'm really expressive about what I want and what needs to be done to take care of me. And so I feel like I would have left this world in good hands, you know, with my experiences and my stories. And I, I, call, I call them stories um, because when people are dying, their brains are firing so much with different memories that can be confabulated and mixed up with each other. And they feel that it's real. But it's, you know, a story. And when I am presented with the stories that I tell myself, I'm reminded that, you know, when I think of a memory and I share that story with other people, every time I think of that memory, it changes a little bit each time, depending on what I was doing and how I was feeling as I recall that memory. And so the story that I tell myself can shift depending on any external experience that I have on me. And so um, I think that was really important for me to be okay with the fact that I shared the stories that I wanted to share. And, you know, I think I'm at peace with that. It's okay to die. I mean, we all die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, that was kind of a sub question I had earlier. Have you ever been with a client who actually didn't like believe in their own mortality? Like they were just refusing to accept it in like, in whatever way? Um, I can definitely sense when someone is still holding on because they're not ready. I had taken care of a man who was a World War II vet, and he was just very tense, and he wasn't verbal anymore. He just grunted, and he just refused. He was like, I don't like this, you know. And I just remember holding his hand and whispering into his ear, you know, it's okay, you can go all taken care of here everything squared away because he felt like the way I knew him very methodical man had his lists had his things to do and you got to do it and so I feel like with him he was just 
not ready to go because he had so many more things to do that he wanted to do or wanted to tell other people. And so with me holding his hand and whispering to him that it was okay, I think that gave him permission to go where he was going to go. And um, I was at the tail end of my shift at that time. And when I went into the car and I drove home, I got a call from my agency that said that he had passed away 30 minutes after I left. And, like, I always wonder, was it because I said um, it was okay for him to go? I don't know. Maybe his body just was done, you know. But I would like to hope to think that I gave him enough comfort to ease his mind to be okay with his death. Wow, that's incredible. Um, And um, I guess this is a – I never saw myself asking this question. Have you ever seen a miracle? And I'll define the word for you, just something that didn't seem possible and then yet happened. So meaning like someone who didn't die or someone who did die, but a different way, anything like that? Um, let's see here. Um, I had someone like stop breathing and uh, the hospice nurse who was coming in was, uh, they're the ones who uh, call the time of, you know, time of death. And it was a couple minutes <laughs> But she came back to life. I don't think, like, she was fully dead yet, but um, it got to the point where she was still, she was alert enough to talk to me, and (laughs) she just asked me to make sure that her funeral funeral, um, attire was, like, in order. Like, that was the one thing she wanted. So, like, I went to her closet and they pulled out the the velvet, um, like, I think it was a business suit or something, to make sure that that was the thing that she wanted. She touched it. I touched it. And I think, you know, she passed away like an hour later. But it was very, like, there was one more thing she wanted to make sure. And that was her funeral attire. And uh, that sticks with me. <laughs> yeah, wow. No, that's totally. Um, and so I guess along the same lines, do you, and I'm asking again, like, some of these questions are organic and others are things that I've, you're reminding me of from my experience. Um, do you? Some people call it, they call it animus. They, they have like names for it, but like it's the life spirit, the thing that is in someone. Like, how would you explain to our audience what someone looks like when they go from clearly alive to actually deceased? Um, so before uh, everything freezes up, like rigor mortis sets in, um, there's a clenching and a release. If you're holding someone's hand and you look at someone in the face, their eyes like dilate it's half lidded it's not completely closed and their their jaw just becomes slack there's just no pumping or movement or or anything there and the, this everything just gets pulled down um, sunken I guess is the word I'm looking for um, but everything is still warm and soft and you know uh, but yeah definitely in the face everything just sunken in and there's a sudden grayness um, in the face. Wow. Uh, that is definitely the one thing I would remember is that grayness that you're talking about. And, and again, I'm not like comparing stories because again, your, your experience and everything is so much more profound. So I just want to make sure you know that because you don't know me. I'm, it's more that I'm just like <laughs> yeah, yeah. having these aha moments in reverse. Um, so my other question along the same lines is, would you say then that you're kind of like an expert? Like if you walked into a room on like a game show and they're like dead or asleep, like would you easily be able to tell, do you think? I think I could uh, tell a person, a dead person from a sleeping person. Um, but I wouldn't tell, say myself as an expert. I feel like because I am regularly exposed to this experience, I can observe patterns of behavior and how people react to things and how people suffer, um, but I wouldn't call myself an expert because I'm not an, you know, an expert of their life. Like I can observe and listen and hear what they have to say about their experiences, and I try my best to honor that by kind of being a keeper of their stories. Um, but I wouldn't call myself an expert. <laughs> yeah, and I totally understand. And then along the a kind of a similar line, do you feel that some people? know exactly how and when they're going to die and so i don't mean like once they're already designated as hospice i just mean like in the storytelling parts do you ever find that people yeah Mm -hmm. i had a client who um they were in their 90s and what i usually do is i come in and um make her lunch and hang out with her cat 
and uh, she called me two days before she died, and she said to me, if I knew I was going to die, would you come and sit with me? And I was like, yeah, you know, I'd come right away. And she said, okay. And uh, two days later, it was my normal shift to visit her, and um, she didn't answer her door. I had a key. And so I um, went upstairs and uh, opened the door, and her cat was waiting for me at the door, which the cat never does. The cat usually hangs out near her, and so I was like, okay, I know what's happening. She was sitting there. looked like she just finished breakfast, but she was sitting there with her phone. I think she was going to call me. Um, and so, you know, in those moments, you're like, okay, this person just died. Um, what do I do? The protocol, typically, if you show up in someone's home and they die, you call 911. And they show up, you call, like, all the emergency protocol, their family, or whoever is their main contact. She had a funeral service number already, so we call them. And then usually bring a detective, uh, an examiner, to be like, I didn't do anything to this person, and it's just protocol. But it can be really scary when you show up and there's a detective there who's like, this person's dead, what happened, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Now, some people definitely know when they're going to die. They just feel it. Wow. I, I mean, I could ask a million more questions, but I'm going to move to like kind of the secondary, but actually for me, main topic of this, which is how does your, how do your views on death affect the way you live? And now you already pretty much answered that. You talked a lot about saying you love uh, someone and like that kind of stuff. And I know you said you were married earlier, so I'm assuming like you don't, you, I'm not going to assume I'm going to ask you, <laughs> uh, I make sure to never like slam the door and leave my wife. Like I make sure to like verbally say like I'm angry right now but you know we'll be okay do you have like kind of a similar thing or I um we my husband and I we have you know you have these inside jokes and things like that we always check in with each other we love joking with each other and so this this banter back and forth is really kind of our I guess you would call it a love language of, of sorts but um I think it's really important to pay attention to what you're feeling and express it to someone when you feel it because tomorrow's never promised as much as people try to plan so many aspects of their lives. You just don't know. You might get hit by a car. You know, you might be in a car accident like I did. Honoring and appreciating other people and seeing them for who they are. I think that uh, witnessing really helps you live a better life and hopefully other people will live a better life learning from your stories. Um, it's kind of like a soul exchange because I don't necessarily believe that there are souls that live on from us individually. I feel like our stories create humanity's soul. And the thing that you're tending to is humanity's soul when you're sharing your experience and stories with other people, because your stories may be the thing that will get someone through a hard time because they're inspired by what you did or what you didn't do, you know, your mistakes. And I think that is the, that is the, the soul that lives on. That's incredible. I've never heard anyone phrase it that way. And I, I love that idea. Um, humanity's soul. I can almost guarantee you that'll be the name of this podcast. Um, <laughs> so um, I guess I'm, I'm kind of wrapping up, um, but I do want to uh, ask you in such a tumultuous time with like, um, just, you know, issues with law enforcement, either side issues with, uh, elections issues, you know, so like staying apolitical, but still acknowledging that the world is absolutely kind of in a frenzy. What, what would be your advice to people for how to like chill out and just love and be kind and have that compassion and, and do everything you just said? Um, <laughs> um, when I reflect on how humans can live, like how, how, how can we live better for each other, I think the most important thing is listening to each other, witnessing and being present in each other's vulnerability. I'm so fortunate to be able to express the appreciation I have for the world. Like I just imagine myself saying, I love my body, I love my mind. I love the sky, the water, the earth. I want to understand and appreciate everything that connects me to this existence. And I think that level of self-awareness to know where you are in this world, I think you'll do so much better to connect with each other when you have that honesty with yourself. And um, 
we just do live better by listening to each other. Um, because I do believe that everyone has the potential to be kind, but they also have the potential to be a monster just because of what they're exposed to, whether their upbringing or the stories, you know, the, uh, whether it be abuse or trauma, like those things shape you. And on a national level, like the experience that we're having now, I feel a lot of grief with the, the half a million people that have died due to COVID. Like that is hard. Because when people die, most people go quietly. You know, there's no fanfare. There's no, there's no biography about your life. You just go quietly. Like, that is a human history thing. So many people have died with no story to pass on. And I feel like we're at such an age where it's so important to connect and share the stories that we have with each other. And that listening part will hopefully help humanity ease the suffering one another because our actions shift whether we will have more suffering or less suffering. And I think we have the power in all of us to ease suffering. Wow. I mean, that was such a profound way to end this podcast. I am absolutely <laughs> refusing to <laughs> ask any more questions. Um, <laughs> that was wonderful. I really appreciate uh, your generosity with your time, with your wisdom, with everything you talked about. Is there anything uh, that you would like to add? Um, I think I would like to add uh Everyone do their best to have fun and create moments of joy for yourself because that's all you have in this moment. Um, you know, try something new, even if you know you won't stick with it. Like I skate, I sing, I sing and skate. You know, I do skate aoki. I've done pole dancing. I've ridden on a roller coaster and hated every minute of it, but I did it. And I feel like it's so important to try new things and share those experiences with other people. Like create those moments of joy. That's that's my ending statement there. Yes. <laughs> wow. Well, Matine Justice from Seattle, Washington. Uh, this has been an amazing, profound experience for me. My heart is lifted, even though it got heavy at points. Um, and I just cannot thank you enough. And I, I appreciate you sharing, you know, some of your family history and just about your life and everything. And uh, wow. Um, yeah. I just thank you so much. That was awesome. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you've definitely put another nail in the coffin. And um, this is Mike Oppenheim. This is another episode of Coffin Talk, exit interviews with the living. And we'll see you soon. Walking alone.